and go right on with chapter 11, the muscle system. Here we're looking at a thigh. Here we can consider things like motion around the hip and motion around the knee because that's what these muscles will motivate. Now the hip, because of its ball and socket structure, has so many different motions and powerful motions in all directions are necessary. You have to be able to flex, extend, and hyperextend the hip. You have to be able to abduct and adduct. And the more you can rotate it, the better off you are. Same thing applies to the knee, a basic hinge joint where you're going to be flexing and extending, but not hyperextending the knee. The hinge joint does not allow that. But you do, do allow some rotation at the knee. So looking at this, here's the rectus femoris, that muscle we talked about as being bipennate in structure and laying on top of its three partners, only two of which you can see. This is the vastus medialis. The name tells you which side it's on. And this is the vastus lateralis. Now there's a vastus medius, just like with the triceps brachii, it's behind the rectus femoris, much smaller, it attaches to the femur. But these four bodies attach to a single tendon crossing the knee. This is called the quadriceps group because there are four heads, four origins, from the high femur and even the pelvis, all the way down through the knee joint to this tibial tuberosity, the bump right below your kneecap. Feel that bump on the front of your uh, lower leg? That's the tibial tuberosity. Now, this quadriceps tendon also suspends the patella, holds it in place in front of the knee, and provides stability for that bone and its positioning. Now, this one I included for a couple of reasons and not all related to anatomy. There are sometimes when you say, okay, a muscle can only contract. That means it can't push. But then you have a motion like this with the jaw. If you look carefully, I can go, I can push my jaw in that direction. How do I do that? I don't thought a muscle couldn't. There's nothing out here that it's holding on to to pull it in that direction. And the the answer to that is a loop of bone, the mandible, and attaching the muscle inside that bone. So if I attach the mandible here to an element of the skull up above it and contract it, meaning I'm pulling on this part of the jaw and it goes this way, then the rest of the jaw goes that way. And the same attachment on this side will push the jaw in the other way. So that inside attachment allows for the back and forth movement, the lateral and uh, uh, left and lateral right movement of the jaw. But I included this for another reason. So far, every one of the figures in our books that involve drawings have basically been profiles and not real people. But this is a real person. This is actually drawn on a face of Walt Disney. Now, if you look at the front of your book, the artists were selected from a working group of animators at Disney called the Imagineers, arguably as a group, the most consistent and, and one of the best animation groups anywhere in the world. And they feel uh, they, they are free to work on projects like our textbook, and they do excellent illustration if you've seen. But uh, they have a thing in their traditions in the company to remind themselves of um, the uh, standards of the company and the ideals in the company. And so I think they did this sort of in tribute to him. Um, someone my age grew up in the afternoons at four o'clock on weekdays watching the Mickey Mouse Club, the original Mouseketeers. I think they still have those, don't they? But uh, Walt Disney introduced and um, uh, kind of summed up or said goodbye, concluded each episode. And so all, everybody my age kind of gets to know him. 
this is also an excellent drawing so showing things like the zygomatic bone, the suture, with the zygomatic process of the temporal bone, the external auditory meatus and the styloid process, all sorts of things that you can pick out here uh, from the good illustration. This is a lateral view of another muscle. Um, the masseter is the muscle that goes from the zygomatic arch and the temporal bone down to the uh, below the mandible and provides the main biting force. But you'll notice the jaw kind of splits into two bony prongs and the temporalis muscle, which basically follows this ridge of the temporal fossa and fills that depression. Basically, it ducks underneath this arch that's formed by the zygomatic bone and the temporal bone. So it disappears below and it basically is hooking to the bone and adding to bite force and also the direction of pull is different. So it makes this one of the more mobile bones in the body. You can do this. You can also do this. You can also do this. So forward and back, lateral and medial, and up and down. All of the dimensions are covered by the musculature that moves the jaw. That's why the temporal mandibular joint, the only mobile joint in the skull, is called a modified hinge because it allows not just for biting. Biting is what sharks do. Biting is what alligators do. You know, sharks do have teeth that can cut off a piece of meat. But alligators do that spin to tear the meat away because all they can do is bite up and down. Whereas we eat food that requires a lot of extensive chewing, moving the surfaces of the teeth like this. And it's the complex joint at the temporal mandibular location and the complex attachment of things like the temporalis muscle and the masseter that allow us to move our head, uh, our jaws, and extract all the nutrients possible. This is showing that lateral movement. We've cut away a portion of the jaw, and you can see how from the inside of the mandible here, we're going across and attaching to the temporal bone and to portions of the sphenoid bone um, as it forms the upper parts of the skull. So when you contract this muscle, it pulls the right side of the jaw in a left direction toward the skull and causes the uh, other side of the jaw to protrude uh, off of the left side. These are called the pterygoid muscles and this internal attachment inside a loop of bone produces that complex motion. Let's go back to that thoracic region and look at a very interesting muscle. Now, before we saw the deltoid and we saw the pectoralis major and the serratus anterior, all kinds of muscles out here on the thorax. We've removed them all for a deep dissection. Unusually, we have also cut away the rib cage to expose not the anterior surface. There's no muscle up here that we're going to be looking at on the anterior surface of the thoracic cage. We're looking behind it and at the anterior surface of the scapula. It shows the complex attachment. We had talked about how the scapula is suspended by muscles going to the spine, going to the cervical vertebra, all the way to the lumbar vertebra. Basically, the scapula suspends and holds the arm. So positioning the scapula has profound effects on everything we do with our arms and hands. This is an unusual muscle, the subscapularis. It's called subscapularis because when you look at it from the back, there's the scapula and underneath it, between the scapula and the ribs on the posterior side is the subscapularis muscle. Notice how it goes from this medial border all the way across, ducking under, by the way, the attachment points of the biceps brachii, short head and long head. Here is an attachment from another 
a deep muscle called the coracobrachialis. We haven't even mentioned it. But the subscapularis is a muscle that attaches here to the humerus. And its main effect depends on what you're doing. If you abduct the arm, you're going to stretch this. So it can help. It's a synergist in adduction. But mainly its attachment helps to spin the humerus, rotate the humerus. So it is one of those muscles that can twist the bone to produce a spinning motion. We have a, a, a muscle group that um, allows that twist from the shoulder joint all the way to the uh, wrist. And the, the reason it's so important is that twisting the arm with force allows you to put spin on a baseball. And uh, the difference between a good pitcher and a pitcher is the ability to put motion on your pitches at high speed. Whether the ball dips to the right or to the left, um, uh, the slider or cutter depends on this group of muscles that's attached. Minor muscles that are under the superficial ones basically are attached to the anterior or posterior surface, the lateral or medial surface of the humerus, which determines the direction that that muscle rotates the humerus. So the rotator cuff group, the small muscles, you know, normally most people don't have trouble with their rotator cuff, but pitchers always do, because the more you develop it, the better your curve or cutter, the better your slider, um, or all of the other variation names they have for moving pitches. I, lo I lose track. But when you use it that much and overuse it, it's a good chance you're going to sprain or tear it and uh, suffer a, um, a detachment or an impairment of your pitching ability. The forearm, you see this deepest layer, and I kind of included this to show a couple of points. Muscles that flex the fingers and thumb are deepest layer, right, laying right next to the radius and ulna. Notice the flexor pollicis muscle is a lateral muscle here, deep, but attaching to here all the way to the distal phalanx of the number one digit, the thumb. Pollicis from pollux, our regional anatomy name for the thumb. Flexor digitorum profundus. Profundus just means deep. You'll notice the body of the muscle, as I said, clear up here on the forearm. That's why the forearm is, and the wrist is thin here, but then it bulges here at the upper side because the body of the flexors and the extensors are all up there next to the elbow. And it runs down here and splits into one, two, three, four tendons running all the way to the distal phalanx of the two, three, four, and five digits. We also see that displacement up here. Notice how the wrist is relatively bare. It doesn't have big bulgy muscle bodies on it, allowing the wrist to be very flexible and dexterous. The posterior view, the deepest layer, you can see the extensors running across the back of the wrist. Now we're going to be able to recover those flexed fingers, those flexed metacarpals. When we flex our hands like that, make a fist, we're using the flexors here on the anterior surface. When we extend, we're using the extensors. You'll notice there is a extensor for the thumb, flex and extend. We actually have quite a bit of um, uh, muscular power pulling our, our uh, thumb into that extended position. Um, we also have an abductor pollicis, the one that spreads the thumb out to separate it from the palm. As we said, that grip, that's the brachiator trait, the tree dweller trait that is present in all primates and all climbers. 
Um, you'll notice the kind of networking of this extensive tendon tissue as it crosses the various joints. And here you'll have something like the abductor pollicis longus running across the entire wrist to it make its points of insertion on the thumb. These muscles, of course, are working beneath the superficial layer. That means that they are having to slide along a confined space along the surface of the bone and the periosteum that covers it on one side and underneath the sliding surface of the more, uh, uh, the larger and more extensive extensors of the superficial layer. So it really where it's our need to wrap these muscles in membranes that are lubricated, that are covered with mucus and that slide over one another very easily. Up here at the elbow, we see two muscles that are complementary. You can tell from the right angles of their fibers and from the fact that they cross the joint at an angle, these are rotating muscles. So the anconius producing lateral rotation and the supinator producing medial rotation at the elbow with its main effect being to uh, pronate or supinate the hand. Um, we've already covered this packet pretty completely. Um, and I'm going to I'm going to uh, basically uh, charge right ahead into a deep dissection of this same region. What happens when you remove that uh, uh, overlying muscle, the trapezius, which was here? You reveal a whole layer of deep muscles that are stabilizing the scapula. Now that scapula is a large muscle; it has all kinds of bony ridges and bumps plenty of reason for attachment. So here we have two muscles called the rhomboids. And although it doesn't show it in the figure, their origin of the rhomboid is over here on the spine. And its job is to help maintain the position of the scapula. Whenever you do something with the arm, it tries to move the scapula laterally and the rhomboids stabilize it in its position, gives, gives these muscles something stable to pull against. If you wanna move the scapula toward the spine, and as you can see from the angles, lift it a little, that's what the rhomboids do best. Here's an interesting muscle. The name tells you what it does. Levator is a form of elevate. Levator means to lift up. Scapulae means the scapula. It's attached here to the cervical vertebra, and when it's contracted, it elevates the scapula. The supraspinatus is an interesting one because it basically attaches all the way over here on the medial border, but it runs through that cavity called the spine. So beneath the spine of the scapula and beneath this deltoid muscle, there's a little uh, open space. The acromion and the coracoid process arch up above it and it runs underneath. So the supraspinatus actually follows the, the course of the deltoid underneath it and attaches on the humerus uh, on the other side. So as you can imagine from its positioning, the supraspinatus is a synergist for the deltoid. And that's it. That's our trip through the muscle system, at least for this time. How do you do most justice to